The Crow's Nest area sits on the border of BC and Alberta, and is full of incredible mountains, lakes, caves, waterfalls, outdoor recreation. But it's also filled with a lot of history too. Coal mines, boom and bust ghost towns, railroad landmarks, and even a plane crash. Good morning from Alberta. We're here in Berta, just outside of Coleman. This is Clive, and we're gonna go up North York Creek. It's the creek here behind us to the DC-3 plane crash site. And hopefully it's still not buried in snow because it's, it's still spring. Could be, this could be a complete waste if the plane crash is covered in snow. Yikes, hopefully not. <laughs> <laughs> We've just hiked up to about tree line here, the alpines above us, and we got lots of snow, but it is extremely beautiful. You can see these peaks rising above us, and it is a beautiful day to be up here. Um, Nina is loving it. Fingers are still crossed that the plane wreck is not buried because there's still a lot of snow in spring. Behind me is where in 1946, seven aviators lost their lives in this plane crash. You can see the tail stabilizer in the rear of the fuselage is stuck there in the trees. So it's just, if you come visit in the spring, it just tends to be a bit early because some parts are still covered in the snow. I believe there's a wing under the snow here, which is still buried because it's still late spring. This RCAF DC-3 was flying east across Canada from Comox, BC to Greenwood, Nova Scotia on January 29th. The last place it was seen was Cranbrook, BC. Then it was reported missing, and searches came up empty-handed due to bad winter weather. Five days later it was found by Crow's Nest Pass forest rangers on snowshoes. A large effort was required to bring out the seven bodies by toboggan over deep snow by a team of 12 men. So this year marks exactly 75 years since this plane went down and tragically seven people lost their lives in this location. But I'm glad there are pieces of history which still remain as uh, testaments to their story. Although a lot of the different parts of the plane were, were covered in snow, we, we just saw the tailpiece. Uh, it's still really beautiful to come here regardless. Um, so totally worth it for me, I'd say, um, even though we didn't get to see the full picture. Yeah. Um, it's absolutely beautiful scenery here. Incredible view um, and fresh smelling mountain air. Yeah. Doesn't get better than that. Just across the highway from the town of Blairmore stands the Green Hill Mine, where its rusting structures are still there to see. The Green Hill Mine started in 1911, pre-World War I, owned by Western Canadian collieries. Think about transportation back then. 
The prevalence of the railroad in the West, therefore coal was in high demand. Here is the rotary dump building. This is where ore carts would end up and dump their loads. Now I'm not an expert, but my intuition tells me ore carts would come down the tracks, hit the stoppers, then be loaded into the turning wheel, which tips the cart upside down, drops all the ore into the chute, which then can be loaded into train cars or elsewhere. The empty carts exit the back, and then there's two elevators on both sides to take the empty carts out of here to be refilled. By 1947, more than 500 miners were employed, producing 3,000 tons of coal a day. On the grounds there is a compressor house, wash house, lamp house, where the miners' headlamps were stored and charged, a barn, and several other buildings and railway tracks. This long corrugated steel building is the snow shed, and it leads to the mine at it. Broken core samples litter the floor. This added entrance is right next to the other one. And again, it's been filled in as well. What you're left with is this old tunnel that accessed the underground. This mine entrance here behind me is sealed up, but there's still water flowing out of the bottom into this sort of dank holding pond and there's a lot of scum on the water and it smells very powerful like sulfur. The Greenhill Mine became Blairmore's largest, but changing technology after World War II dealt the ultimate blow to coal mines in the Crow's Nest area. Locomotives switched from coal to diesel, and the mines slowly faded, with Greenhill closing on April 30, 1957. Blairmore used to be called The Springs, because just east of town there's a natural, cold sulfur spring. Its milky, soft blue color can be seen in the marshy lowland next to a beaver dam. It was also the site of a hotel built in the 1880s by a pioneer named Samuel Lee, although nothing of that hotel remains today. Coming out from under this rock, it's a sulfur spring. It smells like rotten eggs, but I like the color of milky blue. It's kind of a cool color. A cool little brick kiln or cabin or storage shed of some sort right into the hillside. It looked like it had an arched brick roof which caved in covered in moss now. I love this kind of thing. But I was actually there to find the old Frank mine. This is what I'm talking about. Here's the entrance. Ooh, very flooded. 
This is the entrance to Frank Mine. It's on the other side of the Crow's Nest River. And as you can see, it's flooded with some real murky water. I'm not sure if I'd even want to get in that water with a wetsuit on. Maybe I could put a pack raft in here and float as far as I could go. Is there another entrance around here or maybe somewhere? Come on, there's gotta be another one. Some sort of rusty wheel of equipment in this rock, part, partly underground somehow. This could be a earth tremor sensoring, sensing instrument because of the Frank slide when the mountain collapsed above here and killed 70, approximately 70 people. So that they're still monitoring the earth movement. The Frank slide happened early in the morning on April 29th, 1903. It is the worst natural disaster in the history of Alberta and the second largest rock slide event in Canada. A massive chunk of Turtle Mountain broke off and slid four kilometers across the valley, obliterating the southern end of the town of Frank. 70 to 90 people died out of a population of 700. This surface seismic station is part of Turtle Mountain Monitoring Project. It's probably a good thing I didn't go underground as there has been ongoing collapse of mine workings inside the mountain since the 1903 Frank slide. Just down the highway is a concrete skeleton of a structure next to the railway. And this is another remainder of the mining history of the area as this was a coal processing facility. To be a miner was a tough job, and the pay was also meager. According to 1915 figures, they worked 10-hour days and paid $2.47. That's not $2.47 per hour, that's $2.47 per day. Boys were paid even less than men at $1.37 for the same work. If the miner did contract work, they earned $0.55 cents per ton of coal. Most of the mines in the crow's nest were underground operations. There was two types of coal found in these mines. One is low in sulfur and phosphorus, therefore ideal for processing into coke, a substance which is essential for the smelting of high-grade metals. The other type of coal had high heat production and desirable for powering steam engine locomotives. Not only does the crow's nest have a rich and fascinating history, it has a bright future as the potential for outdoor recreation is huge. It's regrowing as mountain biking, climbing, camping and fishing in the summer, skiing and snowboarding in the winter, and living next to the mountains is driving regrowth. The past is at the doorstep in the crow's nest, and the views are extraordinary.